here tonight. We'll also have questions from the YouTube community throughout the debate. This is a critical point in the race. You've been defining your differences with each other, especially vigorously in the last week on the campaign trail. We're here to facilitate this conversation on behalf of the voters so that they know exactly where you stand as you face off tonight. Let's have a great debate. We'll begin with 45 second opening statements from each candidate, starting with Secretary Clinton. Well, good evening. And I want to thank the Congressional Black Caucus Institute and the people of Charleston for hosting us here on the eve of Martin Luther King uh, Day tomorrow. You know, I remember well when my youth minister took me to uh, hear Dr. King. I was a teenager. And his moral clarity, the message that he conveyed that evening, really stayed with me and helped to set me on a path to service. I also remember that he spent the last day of his life in Memphis fighting for dignity and higher pay for working people, and that is our fight still. We have to get the economy working and incomes rising for everyone, including those who have been left out and left behind. We have to keep our communities and our country safe. We need a president who can do all aspects of the job. I understand that this is the hardest job in the world. I'm prepared and ready to take it on, and I hope to earn your support to be the nominee of the Democratic Party and the next president of the United States. Thank you. Senator, Sta Senator Sanders, your opening statement, sir. Thank you. Uh, as we honor the extraordinary life of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., it's important not only that we remember what he stood for, but that we pledge to continue his vision to transform our country. And as we look out at our country today, what the American people understand is we have an economy that's rigged, that ordinary Americans are working longer hours for lower wages, 47 million people living in poverty and almost all of the new income and wealth going to the top 1%. And then, to make a bad situation worse, we have a corrupt campaign finance system where millionaires and billionaires are spending extraordinary amounts of money to buy elections. This campaign is about a political revolution to not only elect the president, but to transform this country. Senator, thank you. And Governor O'Malley, you're up in favor, too. Thank you. My name is Martin O'Malley. I was born the year Dr. King delivered his I Have a Dream speech. And I want to thank the people of South Carolina, not only for hosting our debate here tonight, but also for what you taught all of us in the aftermath of the tragic shooting at Mother Emanuel Church. You taught us, in fact, in keeping with Dr. King's teaching, that love would have the final word when you took down the Confederate flag from your state house, let go of the past, and move forward. Eight years ago, you brought forward a new leader in Barack Obama to save our country from the Second Great Depression. And that's what he's done. Our country's doing better. We're creating jobs again. But in order to make good on the promise of equal opportunity and equal justice under the law, we have urgent work to do. And the voices of anger and fear and division that we've heard coming off of the Republican presidential podiums are pretty loud. We need new leadership. We need to come together as a people and build on the good things that President Obama has done. That's why I'm running for president. I need your help. I ask for your vote. And I look forward to moving our country forward once again. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. All right, to our first question now. The first question I'll be addressing to all of the candidates. President Obama came to office determined to swing for the fences on health care reform. Voters want to know how you would define your presidency. How would you think big? So complete this sentence. In my first 100 days in office, my top three priorities will be fill in the blank. Senator Sanders. Well, that's what our campaign is about. It is thinking big. It is understanding that in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, we should have health care for every man, woman, and child as a right that we should raise the minimum wage to at least $15 an hour, that we have got to create millions of decent paying jobs by rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure. So what my first days are about is bringing America, America together to end the decline of the middle class, 
to tell the wealthiest people in this country that, yes, they are going to start paying their fair share of taxes and that we are going to have a government that works for all of us and not just big campaign contributors. Secretary Clinton, same question. My first 100 days in office, my top three priorities will be. I would work quickly to present to the Congress my plans for creating more good jobs in manufacturing, infrastructure, clean and renewable energy, raising the minimum wage, and guaranteeing, finally, equal pay for women's work. I would also... I would also be presenting my plans to build on the Affordable Care Act and to improve it by decreasing the out-of-pocket costs, by putting a cap on prescription drug costs, by looking for ways that we can put the prescription drug business and the health insurance company business on a more stable platform that doesn't take too much money out of the pockets of hardworking Americans. And third, I would be working in every way that I knew to bring our country together. We do have too much division, too much mean-spiritedness. There's a lot we have to do on immigration reform, on voting rights, on campaign finance reform, but we need to do it together. That's how we'll have the kind of country for the 21st century that we know will guarantee our children and grandchildren the kind of future they deserve. Governor Maui, same question. Thank you. First of all, I would lay out an agenda to make wages go up again for all Americans rather than down. Uh, equal pay for equal work. Making it easier rather than harder for people to join labor unions and bargain collectively for better wages. Getting 11 million of our neighbors out of the underground shadow economy by passing comprehensive immigration reform. Raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, however we can, wherever we can. Secondly, I believe the greatest business opportunity to come to the United States of America in 100 years is climate change. And I put forward a plan to move us to a 100% clean electric energy grid by 2050 and create 5 million jobs along the way. Thank you. You've all Finally, I'm sorry, that was second, Lester. And third and finally, <laughs> we need a new agenda for America's cities. We have not had a new agenda for America's cities since Jimmy Carter. We need a new agenda for America's cities that will invest in the talents and the skills of our people, that will invest in CDBG, transportation, infrastructure and transit options, and make our cities the leading edge in this move to a redesigned, built, clean, green energy future that will employ our people. All right, Governor, thank you. You've all laid out large visions, and we're going to cover a lot of the ground you talked about as we continue in the evening. The last couple of weeks of this campaign have featured some of the sharpest exchanges in the race. Let's start with one of them, the issue of guns. Senator Sanders, last week, Secretary Clinton called you, quote, a pretty reliable vote for the gun lobby. Right before the debate, you changed your position on immunity from lawsuits for gun manufacturers. Can you tell us why? Well, I think Secretary Clinton knows that what she says is very disingenuous. I have a D minus voting record from the NRA. I was in 1988, there were three candidates running for Congress, in the state of Vermont, I stood up to the gun lobby and came out and maintained the position that in this country, we should not be selling military-style assault weapons. I have supported from day one an instant background check to make certain that people who should not have guns do not have guns. And that includes people with criminal backgrounds, people who are mentally unstable. I support what President Obama is doing in terms of trying to close the gun show loopholes, and I think it should be a federal crime if people act as straw men. We have seen in this city a horrendous tragedy of a crazed person praying with people and coming out and shooting nine people. This should not be a political issue. What we should be doing is working together. And by the way, as a senator from a rural state, that has virtually no gun control, I believe that I am in an excellent position to bring people together Senator, to fight you, for sensible but gun you did, safety legislation. But you did answer the question that you did change your position on immunity for gun manufacturers. I, so can you, can you answer the question? What I have to why? said is that the ma gun manufacturer's liability bill had some good provisions. Among other things, we prohibited ammunition that would have killed cops who had protection on. We had child safety protection 
for, on guns in that legislation. And what we also said is a small mom and pop gun shop who sells a gun legally to somebody should not be held liable if somebody does ser something terrible with that gun. So what I said is I would relook at it, we are going to relook at it, and I will support stronger provisions. Secretary Clinton, would you like to respond to Senator Sanders? Yes. Um, look, I have made it clear, based on Senator Sanders' own record, that he uh, has voted with the NRA, with the gun lobby, numerous times. He voted against the Brady Bill five times. He voted for what we call the Charleston loophole. He voted for immunity from gun makers and sellers, which the NRA said was the most important piece of gun legislation in 20 years. He voted to let guns go onto Amtrak, guns go into national parks. He voted against doing research to figure out how we can save lives. Let's not forget what this is about. 90 people a day die from gun violence in our country. That's 33,000 people a year. One of the most horrific examples, not a block from here, where we had nine people murdered. Now, I am pleased to hear that Senator Sanders has reversed his position on immunity, and I look forward to him joining with those members of Congress who have already introduced legislation. There is no other industry in America that was given the total pass that the gun makers and dealers that, were, and, and that needs to be reversed. All right, Governor O'Malley, you signed tough gun control measures as governor of Maryland, and there are a lot of Democrats in the audience here in South Carolina who own guns. This conversation might be worrying many of them. They may be hearing, you want to take my guns. What would you say to them? Yeah, this is what I would say, Lester. Look, the, I've listened to Secretary Clinton and Senator Sanders go back and forth on which of them has the most inconsistent record on gun safety legislation. And, uh, and I would have to agree with both of them. They've both been inconsistent when it comes to this issue. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the one candidate on this stage that actually brought people together to pass comprehensive gun safety legislation. This is very personal to me, being from Baltimore. I will never forget one occasion visiting a little boy in Johns Hopkins Hospital. He was getting a birthday haircut, the age of three, when drug dealers turned that barbershop into a shooting gallery, and that boy's head was pierced with a bullet. And I remember visiting him. It did not kill him. I remember visiting him and his mother in Johns Hopkins Hospital, in his diapers with tubes running in and out of his head, same age as my little boy. So after the slaughter of the kids in Connecticut, Lester, we brought people together. We did pass in our state comprehensive gun safety legislation. It did have a ban on combat assault weapons, universal background checks. And you know what? We did not interrupt a single person's hunting season. I've never met a self-respecting deer hunter that needed an AR-15 to down a deer. And so we were able to actually do these things. All right, Governor, thank you. Secretary Clinton, this is a community that has suffered a lot of heartache in the last year. Of course, as you mentioned, the, the church shootings. We won't forget the video of Walter Scott being shot in the back while running from police. We understand that a jury will decide whether that police officer was justified. But it played straight to the fears of many African-American men that their lives are cheap. Is that perception or in your view is it reality? Well, sadly it's reality. And it has been heartbreaking and incredibly outraging to see the constant stories of young men like Walter Scott, as you said, who have been killed uh, by police officers. Uh, there needs to be a concerted effort to address the systemic racism in our criminal justice system. And that requires a very clear agenda for retraining police officers, looking at ways to end racial profiling, finding more ways to really bring the disparities that stalk our country into high relief. One out of three African-American men may well end up going to prison. That's the statistic. I want people here to think what we would be doing if it was one out of three white men. And very often, the black men are arrested, convicted, and incarcerated for offenses that do not lead to the same results for white men. So we have 
a very serious problem that we can no longer and ignore. Your time is up. I, Senator Santa, my next yeah, question look, is actually, it's, actually my next let, question let is for you. Let me respond to what the secretary said. We have a criminal justice system which is broken. Who in America is satisfied that we have more people in jail than any other country on earth, including China, disproportionately African-American and Latino? Who is satisfied that 51 percent of African-American young people are either unemployed or underemployed? Who is satisfied that millions of people have police records for possessing marijuana when the CEOs of Wall Street companies who destroyed our economy have no police records? Senator, right. Senator Sanders. So we need to take. We need to take a very hard look Sen at Senator our criminal Sanders. justice system, investing in jobs and education, a, not in jails just over and incarceration. A week ago, just over a week ago, the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus endorsed Secretary Clinton, not you. He said that choosing her over you was not a hard decision. In fact, our polling shows she's beating you more than two to one among minority voters. How can he be the nominee if you don't have that support? Well, let me talk about polling. The secretary... <laughs> As Secretary Clinton well knows, when this campaign began, she was 50 points ahead of me. We were all of three percentage points. Guess what? In Iowa, New Hampshire, the race is very, very close. Maybe we're ahead in New Hampshire. In terms of polling, guess what? We are running ahead of Secretary Clinton in terms of taking on my good friend, Donald Trump, beating up by 19 points in New Hampshire, 13 points in the last national poll that I saw. To answer your question, when the African-American community becomes familiar with my congressional record and with our agenda and with our views on the economy and criminal justice, just as the general population has become more supportive, so will the African-American community, so will the Latino community. We have the momentum. We're on a path toward victory. Let's Google's, uh, actually, Governor, I'm going to come to you in a second, Washington but Google State. searches for the words Black Lives Matter surpassed civil rights movement last year. And here in South Carolina, Black Lives Matter was the number one trending political issue. Governor O'Malley. You've campaigned on your record as governor of Maryland and before that the mayor of Baltimore. Last year, of course, Baltimore was rocked by violent unrest in the wake of the death of Freddie Gray. And right from the start of your campaign, you've been dogged by those who blame your tough on crime, so-called zero tolerance policies as mayor for contributing to that unrest. What responsibility do you bear? Yeah, let's talk about this. When I ran for mayor in 1999, last year, it was not because our city was doing well. It was because we were burying over 300 young, poor, black men every single year. And that's why I ran, because, yes, black lives matter. And we did a number of things. We weren't able to make our city immune from setbacks as the Freddie Gray uh, unrest and, and tragic death showed. But we were able to save a lot of lives doing things that actually worked to improve police and community relations. Uh, the truth of the matter is we created a civilian review board and all, many of these things are in the new agenda for criminal justice reform that I put forward. We created a, a civilian review board, gave them their own detectives. We required the reporting of discourtesy, uh, use of success of force, force, lethal force. I repealed uh, the possession of marijuana as a, uh, as a crime in our state. I drove our incarceration rate down to 20-year lows and drove violent crime down to 30-year lows and became the first governor south of the Mason-Dixon line to repeal the death penalty. I feel a responsibility every day to find things that work. All right, let's, let's, talk more, let, let's talk more about policing and the criminal justice system. Senator Sanders, a few times tonight, we're gonna hear from some of the most prominent voices on YouTube, starting with Francesca Ramsey, who tackles racial stereotypes through her videos. Let's watch. Hey, I'm Francesca Ramsey. I believe there's a huge conflict of interest when local prosecutors investigate cases of police violence within their own communities. For example, last month, the officers involved in the case of 12-year-old Tamir Rice weren't indicted. How would your presidency ensure that incidents of police violence are investigated and prosecuted fairly? Senator Sanders. I apologize for not hearing uh, all of that uh, question. Would you like me to read it back to you? Yeah. Uh, um, prosecutors in, uh, uh, I believe there's a huge conflict of interest when local prosecutors investigate cases of police violence within their communities. 
Most recently, we saw this with the non-indictment of the officers involved in the case of 12-year-old Tamir Rice. Right. How would your presidency Good. ensure incidents of police violence are investigated and prosecuted Absolutely. fairly? This is a responsibility for the U.S. Justice Department to get involved whenever anybody in this country is killed while in police custody, this should automatically trigger a U.S. Attorney General's investigation. <laughs> Second of all, and I speak as a mayor who worked very closely and well with police officers, the vast majority of whom are honest, hardworking people trying to do a difficult job. But let us be clear. If a police officer breaks the law, like any public official, that officer must be held accountable. And thirdly, we have got to demilitarize our police department so they don't look like occupying armies. We've got to move toward community policing. And fourthly, we have got to make our police departments look like the communities they serve in their diversity. Secretary Clinton, this question is for you. Tonight, parts of America are in the grip of a deadly heroin epidemic, spanning race and class, hitting small towns and cities alike. It's become a major issue in this race. In a lot of places where you've been campaigning, despite an estimated trillion dollars spent, many say the war on drugs has failed. So what would you do? Well, Lester, you're right. Everywhere I go to campaign, I'm meeting families who are affected by uh, the drug problem that mostly is opioids and heroin now, uh, and lives are being lost and children are being orphaned. And I've met a lot of grandparents who are now taking care of grandchildren. So I have tried to come out with a comprehensive approach that, number one, does tell the states that we will work with you from the federal government, putting more money, about a billion dollars a year, to help states have a different approach to dealing with this epidemic. The policing needs to change. Police officers must be equipped with the antidote to a heroin overdose or an opioid overdose known as Narcan. They should be able to administer it, so should firefighters and others. We have to move away from treating the use of drugs as a crime and instead move it to where it belongs as a health issue. And we need to divert more people from the criminal justice system into drug courts, into treatment and recovery. And that's time. So this is the kind of approach that we should take in dealing with what is now Senator, a growing Senator epidemic. Senator Sanders, would you like to respond? Sure. I, agree with, I agree with everything uh, the secretary uh, said, but let me just add this. There is a responsibility on the part of the pharmaceutical industry and the drug companies who are producing all of these drugs and not looking at the consequence of it. And second of all, when we talk about addiction being a disease, the secretary is right. What that means is we need a revolution in this country in terms of mental health treatment. People should be able to get the treatment that they need when they need it, not two months from now, which is why I believe in universal health care. And that's, and that's with mental health time. We're going to get into all that coming Lester, up. But we're going to take a break. Seconds. We need just to take a break. Seconds. And when we come all back, the, the anger brewing in America.